we speak about <coughs> different classifications of people. In the Mishnah, we speak about Moshe, Rabbeinu. We speak about Yeshua, Joshua, who is his closest student. Then we speak about the elders, the Zikanim. We speak about the Nevi'im, the era of the prophets. And then we speak about, finally, about the men of the high assembly. Each one of these classifications of people, each one was on another level. Moshe was on one level. Yoshua was on another level. The Zikanim were within the same classification as Yeshua in terms of greatness, in terms of knowledge wise, but he was, Yeshua was the leader. He was Moshe's successor because of his level of commitment, dedication to his teacher, never to leave his presence. The prophets were at a slightly less level or they were prophets and then we find, it says, The prophets, they tra- until we come to the prophets, the word transmitting is not mentioned. It says, Yeshua gave it to the elders, the elders to the prophets. And again, the word is mentioned from the prophets to the Archikinesto, which indicates that again, it was like an arm length distance between the prophets and the men of the high assembly. They're at lesser level. Until that point, they were all basically within a similar classification. We go to the men of the high assembly, they're a lesser level. Therefore, again, the term misarua, it was extended to them, but it's extended, which in the connotes is a distance, similar to the distance between Moshe and Yeshua. Moshe was kibble term, we see now. He received it. When you receive something, it indicates cannot something close. But Moshe was Mosra to Yeshua. He transmitted it to Yeshua. So the difference between Moshe and Yeshua was there was a distance between them. Therefore, it says he transmitted it, transmission. But from Yeshua through the prophets, the word transmission is not mentioned. That's only mentioned from the prophets to the men of the high assembly, which indicates there was a drop. It was a drop in level. They were on that same level. There's a story, you know, Einstein is the father of the atom bomb. The law of relativity, Einstein, the genius, one of a kind of a genius. A person who has an ordinary IQ, even a superior IQ. To appreciate Einstein, you have to have a similar IQ to appreciate who he is, okay? Of the earlier commentators, what we call the Rishonim, the era of the Rishonim, which ended in the year 1395. That's when the era of the early commentators came to a close. And then it was the era of the latter authorities. This era of Rishonim, the Rambam, Maimonides, he was of the greatest of this era. Rashi was of, this, of the greatest. They were the early part of that era. They were the greatest. There was no decisor of the, among the Rishonim as Rambam. He's known as Gedolei Machabrim. He's the greatest author. His magnum opus was what? Was the Yad Chazoka. With the Rambam writes in the introduction that if you study his work, which is 14 volume, fourteen sections. So it's Yad Chazoka, numerical ma- ma- value of Yad is 14. That represents the Torah's in entirety. The entire oral law is contained with those 14 sections. Rambam is Gedolei HaMachabim, the greatest of the authors. Rashi is referred to by the early commentators as Gedolei HaMachabim, the greatest commentator. There was no commentator like Rashi. So they had taken the handwriting of the Rambam and the handwriting of Einstein and they gave it over to a handwriting expert. 
and he, they told him to analyze both these handwritings. You realize when a handwriting expert analyzes the handwriting, it's not dependent on whether you understand the language or not, or the characters, it's the shape from the way the characters are shaped, he's able, it reflects, tells you about the person who actually, who committed it to paper. So he has the handwriting of Rambam, Ramosha Bar Maimon, and he has the handwriting of Einstein. And he looks at them, he analyzes them, and he says that Einstein's handwriting compared to the other, he didn't know it was Einstein, didn't know whose handwritings this was. It's like comparing a monkey to a human being. Einstein's handwriting was the equivalent of a monkey, and Rambam was not a human being, an extraordinary human being, not to be compared. So let me ask you, if we have difficulty even fathoming Einstein's genius, and the handwriting expert says, my Mari, Einstein compared to my Mari is like a monkey to a human being. Do we have any inkling or understanding who the Rambam was, who Rabbi Moshe Bar Maimon was? We can't even fathom who he was. That was his level of genius. And we speak about the different eras. Rambam cannot hold up a candle to the men of the high assembly. It's a different dimension of person. We can't even fathom. If we can't have difficulty fathoming the capacity of the Rambam, could you fathom the capacity of the men of the high assembly who authored the Amida, who authored the blessings that we say, all the various types of brothos? We can't even fathom these people. And if you can't fathom the men of the high assembly, could you fathom what a prophet was? that the era of the prophets came to an end after the destruction of the first temple. That God communicates with the person at that level, in the sleep state, because you you can't fathom it. And if you can't fathom a novi, which is not even a question, could you fathom what the elders were who were associated with Joshua, Yoshua? And if you can't fathom the, the elders, could you fathom who Joshua was? Could you fathom who Moshe Rabbeinu was? Moshe Rabbeinu, we had a soul, dimensionally speaking, was the equivalent of the whole Jewish people combined. And it's alluded to many times in the Torah. So we're talking about, this is like all humanity in one person. That's what he is. So we speak about these different eras of individuals classifications of people. Each one is at a level, and this is all, they're all part of the transmission. There was a, a great Torah sage who lived in the mid 1800s. His name was Rabbi Shulay Diskin. He was the chief rabbi of Brisk before the Salvations came to Brisk. He had a level of genius that if he would look at a wall made of bricks with one glance, he could tell you how many bricks are in that wall, in the sand. One glance. So what level of genius does he have? When he was nine years old, he was proficient in the whole Talmud. Could we even relate to this? We talk about memories, grasps, photo, everything. And it's all intertwined. Besides their holiness. And if you go to the Vilna Gon, could you fathom what the Vilna Gon was? Then he saw things from every angle simultaneously. There was not nothing hidden from his eye. Even all the secular, non-Jewish professors from all the universities would come and consult with him in the fields of expertise, whether it was astronomy, whether it was philosophy, whether it was chemistry, whatever it was, whether it was medicine, and he'd point out to them exactly the mistakes they made. It's not to be fathomed. So in recent times, we're not able to fathom who these people were. So we study the Talmud, and you study the Mishnah. Is it fathomable? 
And when we study, people say, you know, Rabbi, this doesn't make any sense. You know, you show them the theory of relativity and you say, you know, Einstein didn't know what he's talking about. You barely know how to tie your shoes and you tell me Einstein doesn't know what he's talking about. You don't have the capacity to appreciate who Einstein was. So if you don't have the capacity to appreciate who Einstein was, you have an appreciation to know who the Vilna Gon was or who Rabbi Akiva was, who Hillel was, where the Talmud tells us Hill was so great that if the Torah wouldn't have been given through Moshe, Hillel was qualified to receive the Torah. That was his level of humility. We can't, even, I might have scholarship wise, even on a humility level, a man that great to be that humble. We can't even relate to what humility is. What we think is humble is relative to everything else. Everything is a bell curve. But here we're talking about absolutes and each one in, in his own right, what he was. You know, there's a certain coinage or expression. Person works for a company. And he's working for a company 50 years, never missed a day, never was late for work. And all the years he worked, he received his salary. Every once in a while, increased in salary, never received the bonus. He's already entering his 50th year and he comes to the employer and he says, you know, you don't have an employee like I have. So dedicated to the company. Never missed a day. Never took off a sick day. And even the cumulative sick days, I never took advantage of it. To take early retirement. And I never stole from the company. Never even considered. Don't you think I deserve a bonus? That's what this model employee says to the employer. So the employer says, I want to explain you something. That that you came on time, and that that you didn't skip work, and that that you didn't embezzle, that's what you're supposed to be. That's expected. To earn a bonus, you have to go beyond the pale. You have to bring profits into the company. And if you don't bring profit to the company, you're not deserving of a bonus. In our day and age, anybody who does slightly more than anybody wants to do, that's considered a great accomplishment. But that's what you're supposed to be. Did you hear? He didn't steal. Very impressive. Sure, if you're among a bunch of criminals and one criminal stole less than, than the other, say that's impressive. Despite he's in a den of thieves, he's not a thief or a thief as they are. But what's expected, there's a baseline expectation of humanity. That's what is expected. Anything above that, that you receive extra credit for. That's the bonus. So people who have the perception of what is special is not special. Because what they see special is what, what's expected. Do you think they have a, a, an inkling of what special is? If they would only know what special is, they would behave differently. But since, as I said, we live in a generation which is mediocrity minus. So how do they even have an inkling what to know, how to upgrade? Where they, have, they can't even fathom or consider what is the next step up. The person climbs a ladder, a three-rung ladder. And the three-rung ladder is a room which has a four-foot ceiling. Doesn't take much from to hit his head in the ceiling. He's not going anywhere. Of course, the ceiling's right above his head. So you know something? So why did you get into a room that has a ceiling three feet above your head? You should go to a, a location that's, as we say, sky's the limit. There's no end to the ascent that you can make on the ladder. Well, I figured I want to have that sense of accomplishment. So when I ascend three feet and I hit my head in the ceiling, I think I've arrived. Yeah, you know wherever you've arrived. You've arrived to conclude that you're a failure. But he sees it as a success. You know why? Because other people didn't even get on the three-foot ladder. And that's the way this generation sees things. And if everybody feels he's in a position to pass judgment, and he's an expert in many things, and ethics and morals and perspectives, and what a human being should be, where they have the farthest inkling of what a human being should be. 
of what a human being should be, or what society should be, and what value should be. What we have here in Pirkei Avos is a treasure trove, because what here, it's not only the people who are communicating it are the closest thing to angels, and their capacity is unlimited, relatively speaking, they are the Bali Misora. They are the transmitters of the Torah that was given at Sinai. All these values, all these morals, all these ethics, these are all divine. This is not something they created. So we have what society says and sets is all the relevant. As they say, God's the one who dictates. God sets the parameters of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And that's what that's what this is all about. That's Pirke Ovos. And therefore, the Talmud says that if you want to be devoutly righteous, study Pirke Ovos. If you want to be devoutly righteous, study the laws of torts. Then you're sensitive to other people's property and rights. You don't cross lines that you don't deserve to cross. Years ago, there was a certain person, where he, and he's still involved with Yad Avram. He was a he was a lawyer in a law firm, and in a law firm, every law firm has a, a supply room. You have stationery, you have envelopes, you have stamps, you have many things there. And the lawyers, they feel it's at their availability, they take as much stationery out of the firm, bring it home, envelopes, the children need pens, clips, whatever they need comes out of that supply room. And this person shared it with me. So I said to him, I said, you know something, you know, that's called stealing. The supplies in the law firm are for the law firm. It's not for you to take home. So you shouldn't have to buy uh, supplies for your children when they go to school. But this is a given. Well, it's done. It doesn't pay for the firm to make an issue over it because as it is, the partners take the, the lion's share of the profits. So therefore, you know, they turn a blind eye. But factually, it's not acceptable. Why is it not acceptable? Don't you think I have a right? Just because the employer does the wrong thing, you still have no right to do the wrong thing. Two wrongs don't make a right. Well, he speaks Lashon, I have a right to speak about him. He's a thief. I have a right to steal. One thing is not to do another. You have to maintain your level of integrity, moral and ethical standard, regardless of what society is about. But the question is, what is that standard that we must abide by or aspire to? That's what this is all about. We have to see what the transmission was. What was transmitted from Moshe to each one of these echelons and eras of society down to us and we study it, and we have to understand it. It's not, you know, be a good boy, and we got to figure out what a good boy means. Be an ethical person, and we're going to set the standard of ethics. Be good, and I'll determine what good is and what not good is. I mean, that's all, that's all delusion. That's all foolishness. Okay. We're going to stop.